Income tax, 2023-2024. Business expenses, car and truck expenses. Get ready and some coffee because tax season is a time when we test our math skills and question our life choices. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Most of this information can be found in publication 334 Tax Guide for Small Business for Individuals Who Use Schedule C Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income story. Statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. The sole proprietorship schedule C rolling into line one income of the formula. Which is a little funny because the Schedule C in and of itself is basically an income statement having business income minus business expenses, which could also be called business deductions, resulting in, in essence, net business income, which is what rolls in from the Schedule C to line one income of the formula. This formula basically outlining the calculations on page one of the Form 1040 we see here. Schedule C ultimately rolling into line eight additional income from Schedule 1. This is a Schedule 1 additional income and adjustments to income. Part number 1, Schedule C roll it into line number 3, business income or loss. Here is a Schedule C profit or loss from business having an income statement format, income and expenses. We talked about expenses in general in a prior presentation, those being the most natural kind of deductions for an income tax system because those are the expenses necessary in order to generate the income. They're also the largest category of different types of things within it, which can lead to complications and certain expenses are more complex than others, as is the case that we're talking about here with regards to automobiles, for example, because no matter how good your bookkeeping system is, when we have small businesses that have uh, auto expenses, then there's often going to be some commingling between personal and business because they might use the same vehicle for personal and business. So some of the complication around this particular deduction has to do with that type of issue and is therefore one of those cases where even if you're not doing the bookkeeping for a client, you're not a bookkeeper, you're a tax preparer, you're inputting the tax return, you still might have to deal with some calculations that are basically bookkeeping related because even perfect bookkeeping will not be able to perfectly account for say auto expenses or depreciable items typically or possibly home office expenses. And therefore those are things that we have to basically be aware of on our side and know how to make adjustments for even if we're not doing the bookkeeping. So local transportation expenses. Local transportation expenses include the ordinary and necessary costs of the following. Getting from one workplace to another in the course of your business or uh, prof profession when you are traveling within the city or generally area that is your tax home. Tax home is defined later. Now the reason this gets a little bit complex or one reason this gets complex is that there could be a distinction in what we're going to be calling local transportation and what we're going to be calling travel, which often involves like an overnight type of trip versus our local transportation type of trip. So that's one thing that could have some differences uh, that we have to be aware of. Another area that uh, we could have differences is 
a trip that is is calculated or thought of as a commute uh, transportation as opposed to something that's not commuting. And you can understand why they might say that commuting is not going to be something deductible because normal W-2 employees, for example, often have to commute and they don't get a deduction for their auto miles for commuting if they're a W-2 employee. Therefore, you would think it would be similarly the case that if you have your own business and you have an office that you go to all the time, the commute from your home to the primary office doesn't seem like it should be deductible because W-2 employees don't get a deduction for that type of thing. However, if your home is the office, then when you go to a client's place or something like that, you would think that would be deductible or you would think going from the office one to, to a client or some other location might be deductible. So you can see that gets a little bit complex for us to kind of tease out what is commuting. And one way we have to do that is to say, OK, what's going to be our primary you know, place of business to determine that? So visiting clients or customers. Now, obviously, if we're going from our home directly to a customer, then you would think that would be a deductible thing. If we're going from our home to our primary office and then from the primary office to the customer, you would think the commute from the home to the office might not be deductible if the office isn't our home. But then going from the office to the client, that would be the deductible component, right? If our home is the office, then of course, going from our home to wherever else we're going to go that's business related, you would think would be deductible, including the client. Go into a business meeting away from your regular workplace. So again, if you're going from home, if it's your office or not your office, if you're going to someplace other than your primary office for a meeting, then you would think that would be deductible. But if you're going from your home to the primary office, you would think that that would be a commute, possibly not part of the deductible component. If you're going from the primary office to some to then the third place, that would be deductible. Now, again, you might be asking, how am I in the, how in the world am I going to account for that kind of stuff? Because I'm using the same car to go from my home to the office and then the office. And then I might use the same car to do my personal grocery shopping, which I stopped off at when I was leaving home to go, right? So there's a lot of, so, so we have to do our best to kind of separate out the commuting and the personal from the business. And we can use various methods to do that. We can use the actual method and we might be able to use a, a mileage type of method, in which case, uh, we could verify our trips and whatnot by basically doing the Google Maps and that kind of thing and logging in uh, the trips uh, that we have. Or uh, if we don't have all that documentation and detail, which we would like to have, we, we're going to have to do some kind of estimations to be breaking out this information. So getting from your home to a temporary workplace when you have one or more regular place of work. These temporary workplaces can be either within the area of your tax home or outside of the area. Local business transportation does not include expenses you have while traveling away from your home overnight. So in other words, we typically think of local transportation as the stuff that you're doing that's in the vicinity of your driving radius you know, the circle around your home or your office. Uh, and then an overnight trip could be more thought of as the travels. There could be some overlap in how we, you know, count or calculate those things, but there could be differences as well. So those expenses are deductible as travel expenses and are discussed later under travel and meals. So we'll talk about travel and meals at a future presentation. However, if you use your car while traveling away from home overnight, use the rules in this section to figure your car expense deduction. So in other words, if you're traveling overnight, then you might be using some other form of transportation, such as flying or a train or something like that. Uh, and it might be categorized as travel. But if you are using your car, to do that travel, then you might be using like a mileage method to do that calculation, in which case you're going to be using the same concepts that we're having here for the local transportation. Generally, your tax home is your regular place of business, regardless of where you maintain your family home. It includes uh, the entire city or general area in which uh, business or work is located. 
So once again, generally your tax home is your regular place of business, regardless of where you maintain your family home, meaning you might commute significantly to, to the place of business uh, or your home could be your place of business depending on the circumstances. Example, so you operate a printing business out of a rented office space. So it's not your home, rented office space. You use your van to deliver uh, completed jobs to your customers. So you can deduct the cost of round trip transportation between your customers and the print shop. Note they did not include the deduction of going from your home to the office, to the print shop. They're talking from the print shop to the customers because home to the office might be a commute if that's your principal place of business. Caution, you cannot deduct the cost of driving your car or truck between your home and your main or regular workplace. These costs are personal commuting expenses. So you might say, hey, look, that I have to get to work. That should be deductible. And that would make sense. But uh, if you compare it to W-2 employees who also have to drive to get to work and their employer isn't typically paying for that, then you can see why to keep it the same, you, you, that commuting would not be deductible. We're thinking of it as personal in essence. Office in the home. Your workplace can be your home if you have an office in your home that qualifies as your principal place of business. This would make things kind of the easiest to calculate because if my home is not outside, but rather is my home, I have a home office, then everywhere I drive from home, as long as it's business and not personal, then you would think would be deductible if it's business related in essence. So for more information, you can, you, you can see business use of your home later. Example, so you are a graphic designer. You operate your business out of your home. Your home qualifies as your principal place of business. You occasionally have to drive to your clients to deliver your completed work. You can deduct the cost of the round trip transportation between your home and your clients. Makes sense. Because, of course, when you, when you go to your clients now, you're going from your office, which is also your home. Methods of deducting car and truck expenses. For local transportation or overnight travel by car or truck, you can generally use one of the following methods to figure your expenses. You got the standard mileage rate and the actual expenses. Now, this is where it gets, some, it gets more complicated oftentimes. It's already gotten complicated because you might be saying, well... How am I going to separate my business versus my personal and so on and so forth? Well, you can try to do it with the actual expenses. Now, what are the actual expenses? Actual expenses are the actual gas that you're using, the maintenance on the car and so forth. So that would be the normal bookkeeping process because when you do normal bookkeeping, you would be accounting for the gas that you buy and so on. And that would be uh, coming through your bank account and you'd probably be recording it if you're using something like a quickbooks as it hits your bank account and recording it as gas expense or auto expense same with the maintenance and any other related auto uh, expenses the other thing that's complicated about the actual method however is that you also might get the depreciation of the car meaning you buy the car and then you're going to depreciate it over time so you would think if it was a business related car, you would, you would get the depreciation, the cost of the deterioration in the car or the allocation of the cost over the useful life of the car. That adds a, a significant level of complication because now you're putting something on the books to basically depreciate it and is also something that would have to be done on the tax side because even the best bookkeepers are probably not going to be calculating depreciation internally on the car in part because they can't really do that perfectly because we got to use tax code calculations not generally accepted accounting principles so then so we also have complications if we use the car partially for business and partially for personal usage because then i have to say okay well what's the percentage of all of these gas and so on and so forth as well as depreciation that i get to deduct as business versus personal and i might have to just use some kind of percentage method that might be estimated based on like total miles driven business versus professional right and then we could also use a standard mileage rate which which is supposed to be more simple meaning the irs is just going to say you're going to give me the amount of miles that calculate for business miles 
and we'll just calculate a rate which should be an average that sums up approximately you know what it, what it should cost if we did the actual method so this method is often easier to do and therefore uh, useful but it's still going to be something that that the bookkeeper is never going to be able to account for perfectly right because all they can do is track the actual miles and give you that number but what they're actually going to be accounting for in the bookkeeping are the actual expenses because when they pay for actual gas and maintenance it's going to come out of the business checking account and they're going to record it as gas and expenses so no matter what method that we use we're going to have to basically do some bookkeeping on our end so that we can account for the, the mileage method versus what the bookkeeper did or the actual method we're going to have to deal with the allocation between business and personal if there is one if it's not all business and the depreciation also we have an issue of well which one would give us the biggest benefit is of course a question that would come up which is more complex than you would think at first because the accrual the actual method might give you a bigger bang for your buck at the beginning because you might have accelerated depreciation methods that you can take advantage of even though they're somewhat limited with the automobile but after you've taken that big depreciation hit you're not going to get it in future years in which case later the standard mileage might be uh, a better way to go and so the so so then to really f answer that question in other words you've got to calculate at least in the first uh time that the auto is being put on the books whether you're going to be putting it on at the standard or mileage or actual and calculate not just the first year but try to think about into the future what's going to be the benefit over multiple years as you would allocate the depreciation so that even that gets a little bit messy now once you make a choice then there's going to be some restrictions to converting or changing uh, from one method to the other because of the consistency principle right that the IRS is all right so that's the general idea so what is the standard mileage rate so you may be able to use the standard mileage rate to figure the deductible costs of operating your car van pickup or panel truck for business purposes the business standard mileage rate for 2023 is 65.5 cents a mile now we've seen other mileage rates because remember other sometimes they use different mileage rates for different things so we saw like mileage rates for d deducting medical expenses or charitable contributions those are not usually kept as up to date this mileage rate we can be pretty sure that the irs is trying to keep it up to date otherwise people are going to be quite upset so so they're usually increasing this one with inflation quite regularly which means they had to up it you know somewhat substantially because again we're getting hit by inflation more substantially than than they keep predicting or you know they should have predicted i don't know what there's but anyway caution if you choose to use the standard mileage rate for a year you cannot deduct your actual expenses for that year except for business related parking and tolls so if you use the standard rate you're electing not to do the actual rate which is actually going to be on the books most likely from the bookkeeper so you're going to have to make an adjustment re you know replacing what they had with with the standard mileage rate however you've got these exceptions for whatever reason of parking fees and tolls that can still be deducted even though you're taking the uh the uh, mileage rate as opposed to actual so choosing the standard mileage rate if you want to use the standard mileage rate for a car or truck you own you must choose to use it in the first year the car is available for use in your business in later years you can choose to use either the standard mileage rate or the actual expenses now one of the rationales that you would think is on the irs's side of things is what they're skeptical of here is someone taking the actual rate for the mile for the car in the first year of operations in which case they might be able to take more of the upfront deductions for depreciation the 179 and special or bonus depreciations whatever available and then switch from that to the standard mileage rate which also takes into account everything including kind of depreciation so you could see how people would kind of abuse the system if they got this big depreciation deduction up front like a 179 
and then took the standard mileage rate, which is really calculating everything, including depreciation after that year. So, so that's why the idea would be, well, if in the first year of operations, we eliminate the ability to do that, take that big upfront thing, uh, then in future years, if you switch from one to the other, then that might, that might be okay as long as you don't end up abusing the system with that basically big big 179 deduction would generally be a thought process that might be the rationale for the code. So if you choose to use the standard mileage rate for a car uh, you lease, you must use it for the entire lease period. Now, leases are a special kind of thing uh, because sometimes when the leases are set up so that they are actual purchases, but they are but they're structured as a lease so is it a capital lease or is it an operating lease and then how how are you going to basically account uh for uh the lease in that case so standard mileage rate not allowed you cannot use the standard mileage rate if you operate five or more cars at the same time so that's not usually the case for small businesses that we're talking about here but uh, in that event, again, you have five or more cars, so, so, so no standard mileage rate. Claimed a depreciation deduction using any method other than straight line, for example, acres or makers. So these are the standard depreciation tax methods. So normally, if you put the thing on the books using the actual method of depreciation, you would put it on the books and take an accelerated depreciation in the current year and possibly even get like a 179 or special bonus depreciation. And I, so again, the IRS is gonna be skeptical that if you do that, you can't really just do that and then switch to the mileage, to the standard mileage method because you've, you've got this big depreciation that you took up front. If you claimed a 179 deduction, same kind of thing, right? If you took the actual 179 deduction method, you can't take that and then switch to the standard mileage method which also kind of takes depreciation into account. So claim the special depreciation allowance, same thing. That's, a, that's an advanced upfront depreciation. Claim the actual car expenses for a car you lease or uh, are a rural mail carrier who receives a qualified reimbursement. So that would be a more unusual situation, but there's a reimbursement that came there. So if you got reimbursed, it wasn't really an expense. Parking fees and tolls, in addition to using the standard mileage rate, you can deduct any business-related parking fees and tolls. Parking fees uh, you pay to park your car at your place of work or are non-deductible uh, commuting expenses. So we have a couple categorization issues that we gotta kinda keep straight in terms of parking and tolls and whether or not we can still deduct them even though we're using the standard method as opposed to uh, the actual method and then noting that the parking fees you pay to park your car at your uh, place of work are non-deductible because they're classifying them as the commuting expenses, which we have established are not deductible. All right, actual expenses. So if you do not choose to use the standard mileage rate, you may be able to deduct your actual car truck expenses. And that would be what the bookkeeper is primarily doing because they're gonna be recording gas and, and maintenance when it happens. But then we also have to deal with that depreciation situation, uh, possibly if we're taking the actual expenses. So tip, if you qualify to use both methods, figure your deduction both ways to see which gives you a larger deduction. So oftentimes this will happen when they first have the automobile that's gonna be put on the books, right? And you're saying, okay, I could take the actual or I could take the standard, the, 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 the mileage rate. So, so I could put them both into the tax software. Most tax software will of course allow you to put both into the tax software and the software will help you to determine which of the two methods are gonna give you the larger deduction. However, again, be careful because if, if, if you get an accelerated depreciation method in the first year, then you're gonna get a much higher deduction in the first year from the actual method than in later years. And so, and so then you kind of have to think about the fact that the accrual, the, the standard method you would think would give you a more uniform deduction that would, be what, that would be adjusted for time value of money 
over the life of the vehicle if it's still used in the business, meaning it should see, be somewhat consistent. Whereas the depreciation portion of the actual method is going to be front loaded. You'll get a bigger deduction up front than in future years, which is something to be kind of mindful of. It doesn't just matter in terms of the current year of deduction, but also could have an impact on future ones. All right. Actual car expenses, including the costs of the following items. So then what can I include? Well, depreciation, that's the big one that the bookkeeper's not going to give you necessarily. And you're going to have to figure out, you know, the, the depreciation, which means you're going to need the value of the car at the point in time that was per put in service. If you purchased it, that's pretty straightforward. But if you started a business and then you, then you, you know, you transfer the car from personal to business, that's going to get somewhat complex possibly. So you have to make sure they get, you know, figure out the depreciation situation. And then uh, they got the garage rent, gas, insurance on the car, lease payments. If there's a, if it's a lease situation that you're, that you're dealing with licenses, oil, uh, parking fees, registration, repairs, uh, tires and tolls. So if you use your vehicle for both business and personal purposes, you must divide your expenses between business and personal use. So now you're saying if you used a mileage method, then you can use the mileage to figure out what is personal versus business allocating only the business miles to calculate your deduction. But if you're using the actual method and you use it both for personal and business, we're going to have to use some allocation method to determine the amount of that's going to be allocated to the business. So, so we might have to use some kind of ratio analysis to do that. So you can divide your expenses based on the miles driven uh, for each purpose. So in other words, we might still use the miles method, meaning we're not going to use the miles to calculate the actual expense, but we might say, okay, if I used whatever my total miles were, I can take my business miles divided by my total miles and that will give me the ratio that I could use to then allocate out the amount of depreciation, for example, that I should be calculating on the business portion of the car versus the personal portion of the car, as well as the amount that the bookkeeper probably gave me in gas and repairs and so on that should be allocated to business you know, versus uh, personal. So example, you are the sole proprietor of a flower shop. You drove your van 20,000 miles during the year. Uh, 16,000 miles were for delivering flowers to customers and 4,000 miles were for personal use, including uh, commuting miles. So those commuting miles are always the complication. You can claim only 80%, meaning the, the 16,000 divided by the total of 20,000, 80% then is the ratio or percent that we can say is deductible of the operating your van as a business expense. So more information, uh, for more information about rules for claiming car and truck expenses, you can see publication 463 if you want to dive into that in more detail. Reimbursing your employees for expenses. You can generally deduct the amount you reimburse your employees for car and truck expenses. The reimbursement you deduct and the manner in which you deduct it depend in part on whether the reimburse the expenses under an accountable plan or a non-accountable plan. So reimbursements can become an, a kind of complicated because if you have employees, then of course you would like to pay them as much as possible uh, with, with a, that they get to keep, right? And so obviously they're gonna have to pay any wages in the form of social security, Medicare and federal income taxes. So what you would like to be able to do is give them money where they don't have to pay Social Security, Medicare, and federal income taxes, and therefore you'd basically be giving them more money. So is there any way that you can give them money that is not subject to, you know, the taxation? Any, if you can, if something's going to be, re if you can categorize something as reimbursements for their car expenses if, as opposed to W-2 wages, then then that could be a beneficial situation because then you can you could pay them for the reimbursement and not have them subject to be paying the taxes on it. So but of course you've the IRS is going to be skeptical of that situation if it doesn't qualify 
for uh, a reimbursement situation. So in any case, you got to be, that's why it gets a little messy. But for more details, you can see publication 15. Uh, that publication explains accountable and non-accountable plans and tells you whether to report the reimbursement on your employee's W-2. So again, that's going to be the idea there, right? So you'd like to be able to pay your employees what you can that w in, the, in anything that you can legally provide to them, which is not subject to taxes. That's why like a 401k plan or some type of retirement plan is often beneficial because then you can pay them in essence in a way where at least they get a to defer the taxes and so on and so forth. So, so that's kind of the idea there.